Okay, so we are back, and uh, we have time until 12.30, and um, uh, after listening to uh, the first round of uh, presentations, I think uh, uh, there are a couple of questions and uh, uh, remi uh, remains to be discussed. But first of all, I would like to invite uh, all the audience, if you have uh, any uh, com uh, questions, prefer, not comments, and uh, can you... Uh, uh, you can raise your hand, identify yourself, but uh, uh, to say it very brief and uh, to uh, point to uh, uh, which one you want to uh, get answers. So please, yeah, can can we have a microphone for this? Thank you for your sharings, professors. Uh, my name is Zhang Jieyu. Zhang Jieyu. I'm from uh, the Department of Geosciences. Mm, I have two questions. Um, the first question is about uh, social credit system in China. I wonder if this system could contribute to sustainability. I mean, that, um, like if a citizen um, uh, he leads a more greener lifestyle, then um, he may receive a higher score or something like that. Another question is um, how to educate the public um, about the importance of sustainability, how to make them um, really care about this issue. Thank you. Okay. So who, who wants to answer? Perfect. Okay. You do first. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes, uh, the way they do exactly try to use this to promote the green life as one of the criteria for the scores. And they, so that is the reason they need everyone, they try to encourage everyone to do everything online. And that is they call about the paperless, just wu zhi hua. The way it's become kind of the green uh, energy or the green, uh, if you have the green, use the green energy, if you, the life become green. And they also has another system about the ma yi, uh, yun dong, the ant movement. So if you have the more green life, some of the scores, they will, on your name, to plant one real trip in the Gobi Desert somewhere. And you can see that tree, because that is on your name. So that is the way they really try to encourage you. But the point I try to argue, or the point I try to uh, ask everyone to think about that is what is the side product of that? If you really engage with the Ma Yi Yun Dong, or you engage that kind of green life, at the same time, you are also engaged all of the system, such as they do not want you to make some friends, which is uh, disliked by the government, or by the state. So that is kind of the components together. So that's just a question. I. I can answer at the moment. Thank you. Um, the two issues that I'd like to address, one is I think there are other systems available that are voluntary in which you can test your own footprint, and but you get the information, nobody else. And that, of course, is your personal kind of disciplinizer that help you to you know, be on track, but it's not a part of a social control system. And I think that's a really issue because sustainability is not just the ecological part, it's also the social part. And if you have the social part compromised by just acting more, you know, or adding a more green component, I think you'll miss something. So in that sense, yes, it does help, but there are alternatives that do not violate civil rights. The second point, education. Um, our research shows that it's not a lack of knowledge. Uh, most people know what's good for the environment. It's not that they just don't know it. I think there are two issues that are important. One is the issue of urgency. A lot of people say, oh, well, you still have time. Things are not as bad as, you know, as they appear. So, well, you know, we're going to change when it's necessary. And the second thing is what we call the impression of marginal behavior. Well, if I change, nobody else does. It doesn't make any difference, so I won't change. So for the education, it's very important to give people feedback on what has changed in their own neighborhood. So sometimes communities are put down that, for example, uh, they have the emissions, daily emissions out there and saying, because 10,000 people have not used their car, actually the air quality has gone a little better. 
So we get that feeling, oh, it does make a difference if I do that. And I think that's very important to give that kind of feedback. We all learn through feedback, and little trial and error is in there. And anything that has a long trigger or has a tipping point, it's very difficult for people to adjust to. Because if I go by car all the time, if I do all the, the bad behavior, it doesn't seem to change anything. And if I do good thing, it doesn't seem to change anything. So I don't. You know, and that's, I think, is very important to get positive feedback. Yeah. Just to, <clears throat> to add a little bit to what uh, Professor Wren has just said, one of the things that is very interesting, for example, with the personal monitors that people can carry around with them, and I've been involved in several projects like that, including at the Institute where I am, is that you can see your actual exposure over time. We don't normally have that. That is, if there are only fixed stations, you may not walk near that station. You may not see the same effect that actually is affecting you. So we don't know your, you don't know your own personal exposure. If, however, you have a, a mobile monitor in real time, it is possible to map, in a sense, the way you go through your day and say, oh, you know, today was a really good day. I, you know, it looked like the pollution was pretty low, but you look at the monitor from the, the track that you took, and it's actually the overall exposure is significant. You also get there's a project called Every Aware that was uh, that I, from the European Commission where you see the average the aggregate together of everybody's personal monitor you don't have names on it but you just see the the cloud and you can see how different different neighborhoods for example are and there so there becomes a basis the point of this is that it is both about you personally but it's also about your community. And so you become more aware of the conditions and potential for change in that area. I want to say one other thing about the public education which you raise, and that is that, again, people have to care about this, and that means they have to understand, in a sense, how these uh, different effects in the community where they live at whatever scale, their, their local community, the city, the county, the province, the nation, how those really affect them. And the fact that these are complex phenomena so they don't always have an immediate cause and effect. And understanding that is important in being able to feel that you can learn something about this, not by being given a book of information, but by being engaged in this kind of citizen science. Uh, the second one, yeah, this gentleman. Yeah. Um, my name is Mahase again. I'm from the Department of the Climate Change and Sustainable Development. So, um, from my point of view, I think in alliance between globalization, digitalization, also sustainable development may be uh, unfair for a part of the world, another part of the world, because like the goal, one of the goal of sustainable development, it's like social inclusion, and when we know that the world they experience the globalization effects in different aspects of lives, such as economic, social, environmental, and political. And which countries, which countries including China and also the four Asian tigers like uh, Taiwan, Singapore, South Korea, again, they are champions of the globalizations. And uh, this globalization, I think, they made the world maybe unequal. Like which, which country become richer and the poor countries, poor countries, they again may be a little bit. So. Such, a, such an alliance, I think, it would be uniform maybe for another part of the world, mainly the developing countries in terms of sustainability. 
Yeah, thank you very much. I think it's an important element, and uh, you know, I made this point very clear that globalization has become more efficient in the world that we do, you know, uh, create more wealth, but it's unequally distributed. And the unequal distribution basically is between the poor and the rich in terms of class and individual. A lot of the poorer countries have actually made a strong step forward in the globalization, also a lot of developing countries. So it's quite interesting to see that a lot of countries that 20 or 30 years were called a developing country are now a threshold country. And some of the threshold countries have become almost like OECD countries. So yes, globalization has given some of them a real opportunity because they could now compete on the international markets and they are now on equal footing with the industrialized nations of the past. However, those who were not able to compete fell behind. And that, of course, is you know, the real problem that we have. And it's even worse if you go within countries. So the gap bit within countries is much higher than between countries uh, in terms of the changes that we have seen over time. So I think what we do need first is on the national side, we have programs that redistribute the wealth and also provide more opportunities for the poorer people to become a part of the economy. And at the same time, to have trade rules that protect the most vulnerable one and at the same time, reduce barriers between those who can compete. Okay. Anyone? Yeah, just a very small comment on the last point. I think the other thing besides the economics in this, I mean this is slightly off at a tangent, but it's worth mentioning, is that I, it seems to me that there is an increasing um, political uh, viability power of some of the small countries the, and the, the uh, Paris Accords um, in many ways were driven by some of the smaller developing countries rather than the big giants. And I think that, I mean, I hope that's a continuing trend <laughs> and that it does maybe signal that there are other mechanisms that could be employed um, that help not necessarily directly in the economics but do impact how we respond to globalization issues, in this case SDGs, for example, or uh, climate change, for example. Uh, I also have one point about the globalization. Uh, some people always say in that Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong, as an example, to say that is something about the good case of the globalization that is making the country from poor to rich. But I just want to add one point that maybe there's only partial stories. The other part of the story is that actually Taiwan, Hong Kong, Korean, Japan, or Singapore actually is under the umbrella of the so-called Cold War capitalism. That is, means they are the friends of the Americans. So in that sense that they can produce something and sell to the Americans, that is the biggest export market at the time. That is the reason you can see that Taiwan, Singapore, Korean example, they don't have the oil, obviously and their population is not big enough to consume the oil, petrochemical products in the, inside the companies. But why Taiwan has a Formosa, uh, for uh, the chemical petri, petrochemical company is the biggest, one of the biggest uh, in, in Asia, in, in the world, also in Korea, also in Hong Kong, also in Singapore. They has a huge petrochemical uh, industry in their countries. The main reason, just because that is a good friends of American, they want to install their influences. That they also want to uh, kind of the re restore the, their petrochemical uh, facilities uh, from the domestic country to outside. And why they not move to the Middle East uh, where at that time the oil resources at the time, about the 1980s or 1970s? Because at the time, particularly for the 1980s, they put to the history. The 1980s, uh, there has a lot of the desertification within the Middle East uh, after the Iran-Iraq war. So that is the reason Americans uh, refused to install their, their, their facilities, infrastructure to the places where there has the oil resources for countries, uh, only to some of East Asia countries. So the 
Globalization is the only part of the story why there has Asia Tigers. The other part is very important is the global political economy context in the context of the Cold War capitalism under the umbrella of American-led Western societies. That's my comment. Thank you. Okay. There's uh, one yeah. question. Um, Can you identify into, yourself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, my name is Jonathan Liu. I'm a consultant at uh, information technology field. Um, in Ian's speech, okay, you mentioned that um, sustainability, actually behind this concept, there is uh, awareness of ownership. The ownership, however, can distribute to from citizen, commercial company, NGO, to the government. Uh, my first question is, uh, in your idea, who should lead the charge. In other way, who owns the responsibility own? From the left side of the spectrum, from the individual um, you know, end, uh, is that a good approach that uh, create um, boundary proposal communication channel from the citizen to bring some innovative idea to the government? I borrowed the word from Otwin, uh, uh, boundary negotiation. So I, I would say smartly design a boundary communication channel. Allow the government to allow the citizen to bring up some smart idea after filtering maybe, but can drive the you know, overall operation into a more optim um, positive way. Um, if could, is there specific example which has already been conducted in the Europe. Uh, maybe two gentlemen from the Europe could share with us. Or when you can take up part yeah. of that. But, um, let me start with the response to it. I think what you're referring to and is, is actually part of a broader question of participatory democracy, if you will. And to the process, what we sort of in the re in a research sense talk about transdisciplinary, that is not just interdisciplinary, different disciplines interacting, but interacting in a very fundamental way from the beginning of the design of research or project with the communities, plural, who have some relationship to that issue. The point here is, and uh, I'm guessing that something behind this is that it isn't that the broad public is going to tell the IT professionals, now you should do this as the innovation. That is, the innovation may come from lots of places, but probably in terms of technically, it will come from the technical experts in one sense. But the question is, whose question is it? So the public becomes involved not only in helping frame the design of the development, what is relevant, what is important in the society, but also the way that that is conducted. So uh, efforts to develop materials also means that you have to engage people in the actual discussion of what starts to develop. So is this, in fact, in the right? I mean, it's an iterative, engaged process. And what Ordwin mentioned with a boundary condition, boundary process, or boundary objects in some cases, but a way of working across different levels of expertise, of knowledge, et cetera, those are very important in this case. And the responsibility it seems to be rest, if you will, with the, on one hand, maybe the government, but also with the industry, in a sense, to engage across these, uh, and academia, to be willing to engage, and not to look at this as a, well, we will go develop, and then we'll put it out there, and maybe they buy it or they don't. Um, it really, if that's designed earlier, it means that the public, number one, 
contributes creativity as to what are the issues and how to address it, but two, then has a vested interest in the development of that, as opposed to being passive recipients of some new technology, which they may or may not accept. Ordwin, you want to add? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, because there was also the question about how this is being done in Europe. Um, if you look about, you know, how do we get to collective decision making, there are different kind of rationales. One rationale, as you mentioned, is, or has been said before also by you, is, you know, experts know best. So we have an expect expectocracy that we ask experts and they make the decision, everybody else is happy with that. You could have something like majority vote, which basically says it's better to have 51% happy than 49. Uh, and so if the 49 are unhappy, well, at least the majority is happy with what you're doing. And you may have deliberation, which is the Habermasian, again, back, where you say you have competition of arguments, the better argument wins, and then you get a consensus because everybody says good argument is better than a bad argument. Uh, if you look in the reality, none of these systems really can work in extent. So we have no system in the world where only majority vote or only experts or only um, deliberation. So sometimes we need to see whether there are kind of hybrids that are possible. Uh, one hybrid is club bargaining, and that's done very often in Germany. Club bargaining means you get all the uh, parties together in a, in a closed room, and they bargain uh, about the best decision is a compromise. And we have this right now in Germany, the so-called coal commission. It's the question is, when do we want to phase out coal? The environmentalists say 2025. The uh, uh, industrial people say 2045. And so they say, well, let's do it 2035. You know? So you add the two numbers and divide it by two. You know, that's a bargaining club. Whether that makes sense, whether there are good arguments behind it, doesn't matter, you just bargain. Um, that is not always a very good policy. It's a fairly good policy if you divide um, uh, income from companies, half gets, you know, the employers and ha uh, or the stakeholders, as shareholders, half of it gets uh, the, the workers. So that's fine, it's fair, and, and that's okay. But for a lot of issues on climate change, bargaining is not the right thing to do. So with whatever, called the boundary communication uh, is that you ask each group to say, look, um, we have good arguments, but the arguments could go to both sides. There are good arguments on both sides. So we have trade-offs there. And so we're looking not for the best solution, but for the second best solution. And if we can find a consensus on the second or maybe even third best solution, where you can say, I can still tolerate that solution, and every party says I can still tolerate that solution, then we'll have a progress. It may not be the optimal solution. But somebody is going to be, you know, not privileged. Uh, but it's something where you can say you get something like an agreement, and it's like of a compromise. But it's more than just saying I give in here and you give in there, because that's all what compromise is. It's much more. Well, with my arguments, I can still support that option. It's still in my interest or in my value. I had a better one, but I could live with that. And if you can live with it too, then we can find an agreement. And that's something where I believe in a lot of environmental uh, negotiations that is good. It's done rarely. We have seen some of these kind of negotiations also in Germany. But the German model is still highly influenced by the club bargaining model. To add to that, I think one important word that can we can get in trouble with, which is optimizing or optimal because values are involved. <laughs> so there may not be an optimal solution in some even technical, I mean, there may be technical optimization, but that may not be the appropriate metric when this is a, a question of the, the interests of a very broad segment of the public. And that we have to directly face, whether through the various means that Ordwin has just outlined. Um, hi, professors. Uh, my name is James Wu, and I major in ecology. Um, I, I would like to ask two questions about diversity in general, because we keep talking about it today. Um, the first question is that in the modern world, um, it seems that globalization and the propagation of certain popular cultures are making um, the world more homogenous in a way. But on the other hand, you also have 
immigration, multiculturalism, and even polarization, which is is sorting people into all these different categories. So my first question would be, um, do you th in your opinion, is this world becoming a more diverse or a less diverse place? <laughs> and the second question would be that um, a lot of time we talk about diversity as being a positive for whether political or economical discourse. But is there a possibility that diversity might also co uh, contribute to greater conflict and um, the lesser possibility of really reaching a consensus? And um, really, is there any empirical evidence to suggest what role diversity might play in these discussions? Maybe I can start. Um, you know, I once phrased uh, the sentence, uh, all the bankers in the world have more in common than each banker with their own kids. And that says something about homogeneity. Uh, what I'm saying is that we universalize functional monotony, but diversify spatially these functions. And along that road, we'll find out that some of the diversity is actually lost if it's really space related and if it's related to something that is not equally communicated to others. A very good thing is food. You know, if you go to Taiwan here and to Taipei, you can eat almost all different national foods. You can find German restaurants, you find Indonesian restaurants. But food that is difficult to communicate and that's rather difficult to eat, maybe for it's l gone and lost. And even the spaces where they originate, it's lost. Also with languages. You get a lot of people speaking language, but actually we have a death of languages in the world. So it, not everything is communicated worldwide. But we have the impression, because we have more diversity, that the diversity has come to each space, but each space becomes more and more similar. But there is an expense to that. So there is, you know, if you take the variance of diversity, the end, uh, you know, the, the, the tails of each of the normal distribution is cut off. Uh, the second point is empirical limit of diversity, yes. It's an issue of kind of the coping capacity of a social system to deal with new alien elements into their own social structure. And we just had that thing in Germany 2015. We had over one million refugees coming in at the same time. Um, that was extreme stress on the population and a part of the right national movement that we have now, which is strong, uh, which never had been very strong, uh, uh, fortunately, but this time it has become more strong, was that people felt they could not cope with so much diversity at the time. And I think, you know, if, as you said, you're in ecology, uh, it's like, you know, a, a, an alien species penetrating somewhere. I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, you have the so-called S-curve. You, know, you know, if it's slowly and then increasing, that's fine. The ecosystem can cope with it. If it goes very suddenly and very dramatically, then, of course, you have so much perturbations, as you said, or bifurcations, that uh, people feel alienated and don't feel that they can develop the cohesion that they need to become social beings. Now, from a normative point of view, that's a different issue. You know, we can talk about what's normatively good. If you have a million people starving or being refugees from war, well, it's your moral obligation to take them. But we should also acknowledge that there are empirical boundaries. And that means, you know, we need to do more to make sure that that kind of crisis first is not happening. And if you look at Syria, well, I think the Western countries had a lot to do with that crisis. So they're not the innocent uh, bystanders. And secondly, if it happens, there's a moral obligation. But we should be aware of, the, of these diversity boundaries. I'm, I'm absolutely with you that we need to think about that and also to create and design policies that help people to cope better with influx of diversity. I think this question can answer in two ways. The number one is about the good diversity or the bad diversity or the how to promote the good di or, or diversities. I think the diversity is related to the institution and then related to the religions. 
So if you have a good diversity and there is a better institution to promote good diversity, so when there is some of the disaster coming out, it will be a better resistance to promote or to resist back to the normal situations. So the diversity need to be discussed together with the institution. So become which institution, which political system can promote what kind of diversities. And normally, democratic institutions usually will be have the more better resources and the better institutional design and the channels uh, to promote better, uh, good, uh, the good, uh, more the diversity. And then, that when any kind of the reasons come out, there will be better reasons points. So that's number one. Number two is about the the diversities uh, or the kind of the trade of choices uh, related to the efficiency argument or that kind of things. Uh, if you want to have the more diversity, you may not have the better idea, have the centralized power. And then you can difficult to make any decisions. Uh, and so on and so forth. And I'd like to give the example as the China and India. Uh, China and India both has the huge population in poverty. And if you Take the records to see the China as example. In the whole past 20 years, the global population, the poverty population has been decreased, mainly contributed by China. And if you compare with the India and China, they are huge country, they are huge continent, they are so culturally diversity, religious diversity inside their countries. But why China kind of do better and the Indian still a lot of people in poverty situation? But if you look at the more details, because I just stay in India for about two weeks in this morning, uh, this the beginning of this year, and I listen to some of their villagers, uh, leaders, uh, I think the way they do is try to promote small scale development. And China is the large scale, and by the big companies. So everyone go to the industrialization because there's only one choice. So that they are really get rid of their poverty at the same time get rid of their rural life. Is this something we really want? Although China in the records, they just only reduce all of the poverty, reduce something about the human big hunger issues within 20 years. But if you look at that, they are not that happy. Or that kind of degree of happiness, if you want to say that. If you go to see India, they are still poor, but they are still happy. They are happy. The, the, the argument is uh, put the smile face, in the, put a permanent smile in the people in the face of the poor people. So the way of understanding of the sustainability, the way of understanding the diversity can be very different in China and in India in terms of the property reduction process as well as the diversity. That is my comment. Thank you. Quick comment, um, particularly from the United States, where, as you may know, we have a serious problem politically, um, which is in some sense very much driven by the fear of diversity. And the interesting thing is that many of the voters who support Trump voted for him not because of direct threat to their livelihoods where they are. The places that actually are more diverse were not so supportive. The places that were supportive were places where they feared there would be others coming in and that then it would change, but they had no idea what that would be. So the, uh, the point that I think is worth considering is it's also the perception of that d diversity and the fear of a different, the other, when you have no experience with the other. It's a very odd contradiction, basically. Any further questions? If in back in the back, no. Yeah, one more. Yeah, this back, of course. Okay, so two. Can you uh, finish just this one first? Yeah, way back. Hi, my name is Sho from Industrial Technology Research Institute. And I have a question for all the speakers on the table. Um, so if you were to jump on a time machine to 2050 and take a picture, what would you see in the picture? 
um, we've been hearing a lot about the trends, the big trends going on, the conflicts, and, and possible ways to get to um, how we uh, envision 2050. Um, but I kind of want to to know what's what, how you picture the future. Uh, yeah, so Where I'm in. Yeah, I'm Chunyan Yang from Lancaster University, and uh, firstly, I want to thank all of you for your intriguing talks. And uh, my first question goes to Professor Jian. And could you talk about uh, more about uh, the? Uh, be I think not because of the Chinese government they push their uh, so-called. Uh, environment-friendly policy as a uh, massive a social engineering project. Can you talk more about uh, the situation or cases that uh, you, you note in, the in, in, in China? And uh, can you also talk about uh, the idea of the so-called uh, ecological modernization? Yeah. And uh, my second question goes to Professor Elon. So my question is, when you talk about the engagement of civil society, you say the quote, perha perhaps is more about, uh, it's not about the expertise, but the willingness to talk and to think together. So you said that it is about the collective creativity. However, uh, we all know that uh, expert knowledge often presents itself as the surrogate of truth and is often assertive in public discussion. On the other hand, digitalization provides a platform and the infra infrastructure for the massive people to argue the multiple statements of facts. So my question is how expert knowledge deal with themselves in the even more digitalized and uh, populized the public sphere. Thank you. So uh, about the first one, <laughs> the pictures, the photos. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, um, one of my main messages was it's a question now of whether we are able to design the changes in a way that the positive aspects are strengthened and the negative aspects are reduced. And that is a key question. And if they're not able to do the design, I see 2050 were still based on coal and oil and we're running into big problems in terms of climate change because then we're gonna have all the negative impacts we've clearly seen. We'll have a digital world in which 30% of the population is extremely rich and 70% extremely poor. And we'll have a collapse of uh, probably the global system in which nationalism comes back with a lot of Cold War aspects, not just between two, but between multiple nations. So that's a pessimistic view. And it's not something where I say, oh, it's very unlikely. Unfortunately, it's, it, is, you know, it has a high likelihood. The positive, of course, is very clear. We'll be able to really reduce climate emissions considerably. We're coming to a more renewable energy world, and we find out that there's so many co-benefits to that. But it's not just the climate change. It also has a lot of other uh, advantages. Uh, that we use digital world, uh, and we have trained our workforce to go with it. So we have an increase in efficiency, but also an increase in resilience and effectiveness. And we have a clear, good governmental system that makes sure that the opportunities are distributed fairly and that the extra income that's being um, earned through the digital and other times of innovations that we have are you know, f fairly and justly distributed among those who need it. And if that's the case, well, I see a much more positive view of the future. But you know, it's contingent. So uh, we will leave you two to answer the rest too, but uh, I can add a little bit. For the fourth economy in Germany, 2050, there will be no call. There's a call. That's uh, for sure because by policy. For the fifth, California, there will be no call by legislation. For the biggest one, U.S., probably by 
economy, my market, will be no call. Mm -hmm. That's uh, kind of pictures where, and, uh, and, but there still could be a lot of calls in China and probably in Taiwan. So that's kind of picture of contrast we are seeing. Uh, you know, you know? I just a very, very quick comment because we really, we spend a lot of time talking about that in this tw World in 2050 report. And the, the just a broad, not, I mean, I, I, I don't know how to answer the question of what that image is because people have very different ones, but I think the points that uh, were just made are important. But the other thing is to think about why you want those images of 2050. And the point is that you're trying to get away from thinking from today forward, which keeps the path dependence, the thinking of now, and try to jump and say, where do I want to be in 2050, which is the way we tried to work on this report, and then come backward, which does not eliminate, but it tends to minimize some of the path dependence in our thinking. So when California passed this road, then uh, there's some, uh, I think it's from Sierra Club or, or American Lung Association. And there's a young, there's a lady say, children born in California up to 2045 will grow up by using electricity without chimney. <laughs> that's the image, yeah. okay? So that's, so uh, t tough okay. questions for you too, right? Okay. <laughs> uh, yes, gentlemen. Yes, that uh, number one is about the imagination, but 25 years later, I think more, I, I just want two points, uh, more that just not in addition to the core issues or the carbon issues, uh, I think the number one will be robust and the digitalization. 25 years later, we have a lot of robots in our daily life, no matter you like it or not, number one. Number two, I think the human power and the political will and then the capability to engage with the Earth system will be even more further. You think of like in the future, they not be just only has a car on the road. They might have a car in the air. That is really happening right now. In, in, the, in the Dubai, there has a, air taxi rather than just the water taxi or the road taxi. And the drum can deliver the, some goods uh, for the, the Amazons uh, that in the future also can deliver the people. So in the future, the earth power, the human power will be trying their best to engage the, from the earth system the, to, up to the atmosphere and down to the underground. And that is something we need to deal with that. That is something we also to change our awareness, our mindset, because right now our mindset in the social science is only based on the territory. It's based on the lands. It's based on understanding of the property, understanding of the property rights, all based on lands. How about the property right issues? in the air. How about the other issues on the ground? That is something really happening right now only in the movies, but in the future will be in our life. Back to the China questions. I think in the China, we always say something, when we talk about the people that have the experience of China, they will say they are good or they are bad. But my argument, they to put together. The way is that, for example, they have the argument uh, in, the, in China, they, they say they have a lot of the, the land, the farmland preservation already, because they have a lot of the policy to preserve farmlands. But you need to put together. At the same time, they also make some of the hills become urbanized. They say it's urbanization of hills, Chengzhen Shangshan. So you need to put together to see in the one time they make the preservation, they made the ecological modernization much better, but at the same time, they also exploited the other resources. You put another way, in Beijing, the underground water label has been preserved and be secured. But how can they put more water to Beijing? They transport the water from the middle part of the China to Beijing. That is the Nan Shui Bei, the South China Water Transfer Project. But do you know how they uh, transfer the South, the, how they, where is the water from the middle part of the China? They make the geoengineering. They made a weather modification over the ground. So the cloud water resources in Hubei or in Shanxi has been forced to make the main road forces 
down to the ground and transfer through the channel to Beijing. Three or four years after, the Beijing will organize the Winter Olympic Games. And Beijing may not have the snow. So the crowd over the Yangtze River in the Hubei provinces uh, will, through this whole process, uh, become the artificial snow for Beijing. So that is the situation. You not just only see the Beijing water preservation. You also don't see other places has been exploitation. And you put together, become what I call about the green developmentalism. And if you are interested, I would like to attend the promotion. I have the lectures this Friday. <laughs> you are more than welcome in, 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 the, in the campus. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Very, very short response to your second question of, uh, with regard to engagement um, and creativity. I think the point that I want to make is that there are mechanisms to deal with, uh, first of all, that, that we are not, despite what the way we often are trained, to think about science as being objective and that, you know, we do science, we, you know, we're objective. First, that we are all operating in a normative space however we want to do that, who pays for the research, who benefits from it, who doesn't benefit, where does it go, who does not even have access to it, etc. So given that, it becomes an issue not of truth. Somebody once in Brussels at a meeting when I gave a talk about social contract of science said, no, it's about the truth. I said, yeah, and how, how do you know? Um, what's the truth? The point is, what's the best we understand as part of the social contract of doing science and attempting to falsify what we understand to see if it is really robust to understanding and knowledge? And that also means that we have to be reflexive. We have to reflect on how we are doing science. And we have to be open and transparent in that process. And that means also in being more inclusive of other kinds of knowledge. Yes, experts have, the way I would put it is this, for the complex problems, we absolutely need the depth and expertise of many disciplines. It's not that they should go away, we desperately need that. But we also need, so that's necessary, but it's insufficient by itself to deal with the complexity of the issues we face. Therefore, we need not only the depth, but we need the process of synthesis and breadth. And I mean, I, I, this was mentioned earlier when you introduced me. I, I started in, in laser physics and chemistry, ended up running a company designing learning environments for 230 museums around the world, Disney, whatever, thinking about education and learning in a particular way, and ended up in, in sociology. And I'm now an expert in nothing, but what I'm trying to do is to help in the synthesis of these different dimensions, not just social science, natural science, but art, philosophy, history, um, literature, what it, uh, ethics, and that's what we need to keep moving on. Yeah, we have uh, two minutes uh, uh, beyond our uh, limit. As you can see, these three uh, gentlemen sitting together, we can talk forever. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, there's so many questions we can ask. I reserve my, my, my questions for the next time you come here because uh, I saw the conflict between the two, two sides of power I in the distillation in Professor Jens and the, the, the slides of what can we do. You know, so that's, uh, I don't have time to ask, so you, you don't have time to ask, right? <laughs> so with this, I will conclude these uh, wonderful sessions, and uh, can you all give the big applause to our audience? Uh,